Hello and welcome and we begin with the first book of Omeros. This directly follows from the other lecture, the previous lecture that we had where, wherein we had discussed the background and setting to this epic poem, this post-colonial epic poem. So if you haven't seen that video, uh, this particular, it is better to watch that video before coming on to this one, uh, be because going on with, uh, with this one. It is. Uh, it play. It would place whatever we are discussing today uh, would make more sense if you have watched the previous video. So please go ahead watch that one if you haven't till now. So we begin with the first chapter, book one, chapter one, and as with any other, as with any other text, so it is with epic poem and so it is with Omeros. It begins with a kind of exposition, right? It begins with an exposition which introduces the scene of action, the background, the setting, the characters and so on. So here it is, this is the background, uh, this, is a, this, is where it star this is where the poem starts. This is how one sunrise, we cut down them canoes, Philoctete smiles for the tourists who are trying his, who are trying, who try taking his soul with their cameras who tried taking his soul with their cameras. One's wind brings the news to the Laurier Canal. So it is, it is a kind of a very modern or rather a postmodern scene where this man with a very Greek name, right, a direct uh, reference to the, Homer, uh, the Homeric epic. So with this name, uh, Walcott establishes the reference to Homeric epic, but at the same time, there is a, it, the context is different, right? We we cut we cut down them canoes. So making canoes, what is being cut down? The trees, right? The trees are being cut down to make canoes, and this is what Philoctete is explaining to the tourists who are try, try who try taking his soul with their cameras. They're trying to capture this, to capture this essence of life on this island. Uh, who try, but if they are just who try taking, right? They cannot. It is who try taking. You know, they try the tourists. We, as tourists, we try to capture. We try to see. But after all, it is just a camera. It's not life. So that's how it goes on from there. So the trees, their leaves start. Sh uh, their leaves start shaking the minute the axe of sunlight hit the cedars because they could see the axis in our own eyes. When live the ferns, they sound like the sea that feed us, fishermen all our life, and the ferns nodded, yes, the trees have to die, and so on. So there is a kind of, uh, there is a kind of, I, uh, I don't know, to me there is a stoicism in this scene where the trees see axis, the trees see their death, and they, st uh, they stand waiting for their death. It is, they have to die. The trees have to die. Because they, like the, like the they, are, they sound like the sea that feed us. So, the tree, the landscape, the tree, the forest, the sea, it's all feeding the fishermen. It's all feeding the community. And the community is taking from these, la uh, this natural landscape. And so, the trees have to die. This image of death continues throughout. It lingers throughout. When it came back, it give it give us the spirit to turn into murderers. So there is an acknowledgement: we turn into murderers. So trees are almost they are, they are the they are uh, the beings. They are the they are living beings of the island, and they are being murdered. They are being cut so that uh, fishermen can make canoes. Right. So the community is taking over the natural landscape for its survival. I lift up the axe and pray for strength in my hands to wound the first cedar. So it's almost throughout. It is a sense of killing the trees. It conveys a sense of killing the, tree, uh, the trees, the natural landscape, the community taking from the landscape. So there is a, it's, not, it's not a symbiotic. We do not really see a symbiotic relationship. It is almost as if the community is living off the natural, it's exploiting the natural landscape in order to survive. So I said constantly the image of 
the silence is sown, right? So the the sibilance here, the sinister sibilance, use of sibil the S sound, the silence is sown. So it is a very sinister image, and there is also a kind of stoicism as the trees stand and trees stand and accept their death, so that this community can go on living. The island has seen uh, the island has seen the landscape has seen these things over and over again. When the sunrise brightens the river's memory and the huge and the waves of huge ferns are nodding to seas sound, they have they these scenes are common. This experience is common. Uh, earlier, the island was known as, we discussed this, Luanalo, right, where the iguana is found. So the iguana, the, the animal that is found on this island, it has seen these scenes of destruction. The slit pods of its eyes ripened in a pause that lasted for centuries, that rose with the Arawak smoke till a new race, unknown to the lizard, stood measuring the trees. These were their pillars that fell, leaving the blue space for a single god where the old gods stood before. Right? So the iguana has seen this, the lizard uh, that is found on uh, St. Lucia, and the island was named after, after that creature, that, that uh, animal. Uh, it has seen these, it has seen these scenes of destruction, it has seen this change. So not only the change in landscape, but the change, the destruction of a set of people, the Arawaks, right? So the Arawaks disappeared and gave place to this new race, right? The new race that comes from outside. The new race unknown to the lizard. So the new race is unknown to this native uh, animal of the island, the new race which is coming from outside. And the new race, which is, of course, it is a reference to the colonizers coming to the island, the colonizers, unknown to the, uh, foreign to the natural landscape, foreign to its flora and fauna. Uh, the lizard knew the Arawaks, the new race is unknown. And what does a new race do? It stands measuring the trees. These were their pillars that fell. Who is their hair? Is it Arawaks who, for whom the, the natural landscape had this stability, this concreteness, pillars? Or is it the new race for whom it is all it, it is all the same, right? Whether it is natural or whether it is man man made, it can be destroyed. Right? So these were their pillars that fell, leaving a blue space, right? The emptiness, leaving the blue space. So the sky that was that had uh, trees, you know, you where you where the lizard could see see trees and where people could see trees, now there is an empty blue space. For a single god. So it is not just what well, it is not just a change of race, but there it's a change of culture, a single god where all gods stood before. Right? So a single god is it a reference to Christianity taking over to the native over the native uh, religions? So a single god where all gods stood before. So it's not what what changes does the new race bring? not only the disappearance of older race, older people, older the natives, but also the change in landscape, the beginning of exploitation of the landscape, and also cultural changes like, and as you go on, he talks about language, but here is a little reference to religion, where a single god, for a single god, where all gods stood before. And here he goes on again to describe the destruction of the trees, so after after being fallen, the generator whipped. So the generator and the chips, you know, that wooden uh, the saw, the mechanical saw that is uh, crushing the trees, cutting and everything. It's it's like an animal. It's like a predator killing, right? The images of murder and killing throughout uh, the first part of Omeros, This first uh, initial in the initial descriptions of the island where we see not only how the past, the past that has disappeared, right, but also how the landscape is slowly changing, how the land, not, and it's not a change for good, all these murder and killing metaphors, all this murder and killing imagery, the, pre, the imagery of a predator. So these are not, it's the change, the so-called development is actually exploitative. It is not just of uh, the environment, but also of its natives 
the people, the life on the island as it was. Um, okay, so here we are, and here it goes on. We are he here is Achille, right? Achilles, and he is a part of the new race or the new races that have come to inhabit the island, and this is how we are introduced to him, to Volcott's uh, Achilles. He swayed back the blade and hacked the limbs from the dead god, knot after knot, wrenching the seaward veins from the trunk as he prayed. Tree, you can be a canoe, or else you cannot. The bearded elders endured the decimation of their tribe without uttering a syllable of that language they had uttered as one nation. Uh, and so on it goes, but I think this is important that Achille, uh, here, this is how, this is how Walcott introduces us to this character, to this uh, central, the main protagonist of his epic, Achilles. Uh, him, as a part of the new race, as a part of this new enterprise, him cutting down, as a part of this group of men, cutting down the trees, and it is a particularly uh, violent image, hack the limbs from the dead god, not after not, severing the veins, or wrenching the seaward veins from the trunk as he prayed, tree, you can be a canoe or else you cannot, right? So, despite the prayer, he goes on, despite this, it, there is a... Okay, since we are uh, moving t in terms of, uh, according to the themes, so I'm going to move back and forth the book. So, here I am in book 10, where we continue where, where there is another important, uh, uh, important part which continues on the theme of destruction of the landscape. And here we see one of the characters, the British, the British war veteran that I had introduced in book uh, in, the, in the previous video, Major Plunkett. And we will go back to Major Plunkett when we discuss the other characters and other themes. But here this character is surveying the landscape of St. Lucia and he comes across uh, the the Bennett and Ward, you know the the enterprise, the colonial enterprise, which left its mark on the landscape, the destructive mark on the landscape of of Saint Lucia, and this is almost like it's look at the imagery that lime pits of Auschwitz, and the sulphur, the gate of sulphur through which he he here is Major Plunkett, so the gate of sulphur through which he must pass singeing his memory so it, it's not just a, it's it the memory that burns that has been burnt not just in in the in his mind but also it is a memory burnt on the landscape it's like a burn on the landscape and though he pinched his nostrils it's a stench it's a stench of the past it's the unpleasant memory of the past though he pinched his nostrils until the stench faded into verger's peace like registering skulls in the lime pits of Auschwitz. It's like that is how the island, this na uh, the island, the natural landscape of the island has been destroyed. That he uses this metaphor of Auschwitz, the concentration camp, uh, to describe the destruction of the natural landscape. The wound closed in smoke, then wind would reopen it, the geyser would jet its gas through the cracked fissure and the way that steam suddenly hissed from the bonnet and so on. It's like describing how the me mechanization, how we, you know, it continues the images from the first here we see how mechanization of the, how industrialization of the island has come at the cost of slow destruction, slow and cruel destruction of the island, the larger and greener ferns, uh, their white fronds large as the fan bells passing through sulphur mine with its rusted wheel, its horses of lianas, where Messrs. Bennett and Ward, his countrymen in 1836, went home to England as Bush and high taxes closed their wild enterprise. Right, the wild enterprise which was in 1836, it was closed. Now, if you remember again, this year 1836 is, is 1830s are important ta important time here in the uh, on the islands. This is the uh, time when the slaves are being emancipated. So why did so Bennett and Ward, who had been destroying, who had set up this factory to destroy to take over the island that had been destroying the island, it is closed down. 
is it similar to what we see in white uh, Sargasso Sea that was happening? So, 1836, it closes ben Bennett and Ward, the 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 uh, the colonial entrepreneurs leave the island and go back to England. They clo foreclose their wild enterprise. Is it the bush? It's the, is it the taxes, or is it unsaid the emancipation of the slaves? Right, that is unsaid here. So they leave, but they leave this uh, this this burn on the landscape. This this emptiness or rather this this charred landscape behind reeds of funeral moss drape their endeavor a huge wheel's teeth locked in rust what had stopped their uh, scheme quarrels of omani had one caught a fever and yellow as that leaf in his delirium blab babbled of an alchemy that could turn sulfur to gold or and so on so the the narrator here is trying to work out what made ben Bennett and Ward leave this enterprise that is now going to rust, right? It is still there like a blot on the landscape. Had they come, uh, had they had another offer somewhere on the outer boundaries of freedom and free enterprise that came within an empire, right? Did they go for another lucrative enterprise? Did they go for to another, the celebration of freedom and free enterprise that comes with empire and it is quite ironical for a post-colonial reader because we know that the empire is was not actually about freedom and free enterprise it was about creating colonial monopolies it was about creating inequality enslaving uh, of Africans and Asians so uh, we know that freedom and free enterprise this equation of the empire, you know, the very fact that it is an empire means that there is no equality. There is a ruler and there is a, there are the subjects and then there are the exploited, exploited slaves. So it is quite ironical this association of freedom and free enterprise that came with an empire. And Bennett and Ward, who were colonial entrepreneurs, who were a part of this enterprise, left this blot on the landscape, right? Uh, so the, colo coloni colo uh, the colonial enterprise, the na landscape carries this memory. Literally, it does not tell of this memory. It embodies this memory. I this memory. It embodies this colonial exploitation. The landscape. You can see the colonial past on the landscape of Saint Lucia. Its exploitation. You can see it on the landscape of uh, Saint Lucia, in terms of not just old factories, but also the destruction of the, the decimated landscape. So the destroyed factory lays here, the reminders of colonial enterprise lay here, uh, the factory as well as the uh, destroyed landscape. So coming to the other themes, uh, let's talk about the characters, Achilles and Achille and uh, Hector, right? And uh, these are, as you see, this, these are analogous to Homeric heroes in Iliad. However, uh, here they are the fishermen in Saint Lucia. But who are they? They are not the natives of Saint Lucia. Who are they? They are the descendants. Hector, as well as Achilles, are and Helen. They are the descendants of the African slaves who were transported to the Caribbean islands. We have already read about them in White Sagasso Sea. So, Italy and uh, uh, Hector and Helen and Philoctete, they are all descendants of the African slaves who have, who have come to the, who were brought to the island. Uh, and they are now the fishermen in St. Lucia. Uh, they bear these very, these, they bear all these Greek names like Italy, Helen, uh, these are very common, as I said, in St. Lucia because uh, when the slaves were brought, they were not just brought, uh, they were given new names. So, there, it was a new identity imposed on them. Their, oh, their names were taken away and they were given new names. So, and we will discuss this whole question of taking away names and giving new names. It was an important theme in White Sagasso Sea as well and here it is. Uh, here, Walcott uh, spends a lot of time 
talking about it especially in book 3 and we will come back to that when we discuss book 3. But that is this is the theme, this is the theme where which is very Homeric and which is very which goes back to Iliad, men can kill their own brothers in rage. But a madman who tore Achilles undershirt from one shoulder also tore at his heart. This is Achilles and Hector fighting for a can, but actually they are really fighting for the love of Helen. The rage he felt against Hector was shame to go crazy for old bailing tin crusted with rust. The duel of these fishermen was over a shadow and its name was Helen. So here we go back to this Homeric theme, Hector and Achilles fighting for Helen. That is, uh, that is uh, what uh, Walcott brings from Iliad. But this fight then takes on several other dimensions, several other layers, because this is not this is not in old Greek, ancient Greece. This is in a post-colonial world. This is in this island of Saint Lucia, where these slaves have been brought. It is about slavery. It is about colonialism. So these these things add other layers. These themes add other layers to this uh, to this Homeric conflict. Another important character in this group is Philoctete and we that is uh, we, the poem begins with him showing his wound to the uh, showing the fest to the tourists so he's an important character and his wound as I said in the previous video in the previous lecture that it is an important metaphor he believed the swelling came from the chained ankles of his grandfathers or else wh why was there no cure that was a cross he carried that the cross he carried was not only the anchors but that of his race for a village black and poor as the pigs that rooted in its burning garbage there was hooked then were hooked on the anchors of the abattoir so the wound has no cure it hasn't been cured and he believes that it comes from the chain ankles of his grandfathers who are why are the ankles chained why are the who are the who were his grandfathers the slaves brought chained and brought from africa in book three when uh, Achilles visits you know dream visits africa we see these this thing these uh, capture of slaves and their enslavement and being chained and being transported so the swelling the wound that is where the wound is so the wound is like a metaphor a breach of history a metaphor of this historical breach where the race right his his race for a village black and poor so his race a race that was enslaved and transported right and now that it has been uh, it has kind of severed its link from its homeland there is no cure for the wound there is no cure for the race it's like a festering the history is like a festering wound that breach in history the break in history is like a festering wound until that breach is healed this wound cannot be healed in a way another important character uh, here is seven seas the blind poet and blindness in itself is a metaphor so blindness and this is a very this comes from right from greek uh, poets and poetic tradition of blind poet being a visionary so when you cannot see and w when your eyes are not clouded by the concerns of this world you cannot see the concerns of this world or you are not trapped within this world by your sight then you can see you have a vision beyond you have a larger vision so the poet can see beyond the world uh, the blind poet can see beyond this world beyond the surface of this world so that is why blindness is a metaphor so blind uh, uh, seven seas the blind poet omeros and of course here we have uh, uh, you know the the name homer is kind of given a meaning that comes that is very uh, indigenous or was a conch shells invocation 
Mo was mother and sea, and Os a grey boon, and the grey white surf as it crashes and spreads its sibilant collar on a lace shore. Omeros was a crunch of dry leaves and the wash that echoed from from a cave mouth when the tide had has ebbed. So it's it's very Caribbeanized. It's very, it's turned. It's uh, it has transplant, it has uh, Walcott kind of transplants the name uh, to St. Lucia, to Caribbean landscape. So here is a little bit more, I think this is book uh, chapter 3 and here is a little bit more about the poet Blind Sea and uh, sorry Seven Seas, sorry the Blind Poet Seven Seas and here we see and you see how it is it is a very localized and a regionalized description he sits on a crate after perils have set out and so on a sharp his gnarled hands on his sticks uh, he has sometimes he would sing and the scraps and the scraps blew on the wind when her when her beads rubbed their rosary Olsen or more he claimed he had sailed around the world and so on so and they give him they give him a name they question him from a cod liver oil label so there's an intermingling they were greek to her and an old or old african babel so who is she here she is mark hillman right another important character and i would say uh, a little bit, bit like christophine in uh, white cigar so see uh, she has she is like christophine Fien, she is kind of a wise woman an obia woman so she's another very important character in this uh, in this poem and as we, we shall see later she is the one who heals Philoctetes wound towards the end of the epic by returning back to indigenous knowledge and in the indigenous wisdom so the history the breach of history is healed when she returns back to her roots and discovers the cure. So Mark Hillman, uh, who runs this No Pain Cafe, right? No Pain Cafe. She is another important character. And as here, uh, and this is Chapter Ten, Book One. And as I discuss in White Sagasso, see the syncretic culture where uh, she had taken Holy Communion. So Christianity kind of uh, is. Re, uh, is kind of uh, practiced along with old African uh, religions. So Mark Hillman as an Obia woman uh, is represents that that um, you know, those two uh, very different divergent streams of religion knowledge being you know being forced yoked together. She took Holy Communion with Maud sometimes. So Maud is uh, Plunkett's major Plunkett's wife and she is a European and she's a Christian so he she here in Mark Hillman she took holy communion with Maud sometimes but there was an old African doubt that paused before taking wafers white leaves so there is African belief systems which coexist with Christianity so she's a Sibyl an Obia woman wed with a spider's knowledge of an afterlife you know different webbed different knowledge different belief systems uh, webbed together in her life uh, in her mind so we've already talked about african characters there uh, there is another set of characters and as i said uh, the book uh, homer sorry walcott's plot moves between these characters taking up one story and then moving on to the other story uh, and these stories brush against each other at various points they meet these characters meet and they are all they interact and so the, the stories are tied with each other but uh, they are different uh, groups or sets of character and Major Plunkett is a British war veteran who lives in St. Lucia who stayed back in St. Lucia and his wife Maud right his wife Maud who is dying right of some sickness much like uh, which is which is suspected we sus uh, which is suspected to be cancerous so uh, they also live in uh, saint lucia and helen works at their house they have a pig farm in saint lucia and helen works for for them that is how through helen uh, that these two plots uh, uh, the achilles 
Hector and that plot is kind of tied with Major Plunkett and his history of historical research on St. Lucia. But let us read more about Major Plunkett and his wife Maud. So, as a British war veteran, uh, we see constantly, you know, Major Plunkett comes from a very, uh, we see the colonial discourse, the victories of uh, Britain, the battles, its colonies. Now, all these descriptions are interwoven with the description of Maud and Major Plunkett. But we also have this very interesting, this is book two of, uh, sorry, chapter two of book one that there is a certain, there is a wound in his character. So, the wound is not just Philoctetes wound, but there is a wound in Major Plunkett, um, the, uh, there is a wound that Major Plunkett also carries. This wound I have stitched into Plunkett's character. And I find this very interesting because it is almost like a, like the author coming to the surface and saying, I have given this wound to Plunkett, right. So, I, the author coming and saying, dis displaying his uh, uh, authorial, uh, this his uh, authority as an author so that I have given the I have stitched this into Plunkett's character. So, I have given him this wound and make what you want of it. He has to be wounded right there. He has to carry a wound. He has to be wounded. Affliction is one theme of this fiction of this work this fiction since every eye is a fiction finally right. So, it is almost like the author coming to the forefront and saying that this, this story is about wounds, this, this story is about breaches, this story is about these, uh, this brokenness of past that these wounds are symbolize. So, and it is a very metafictional moment, you know what is metafiction, where fiction kind of talks about its own fictionality right fiction that is this Omeros talks about how it is it displays its own fictionality. So, just telling us that Plunkett is a fictional character and he is carrying this wound make what you want of it and because the theme of this fiction is affliction right it is wound is a theme woundedness is a theme of this fiction. So, it is a very metafictional moment that uh, that uh, the narrator or the author uh, brings in here. And here is old Maud, Maud Kilman's uh, description, uh, sorry Maud, sorry Maud Plunkett's description and you would see throughout, I am just picking up this one instance, but throughout she is, she is associated with this, uh, no, uh, Major Plunkett and his wife, both of them are associated with this colonial description and colonial imagery whenever they, whenever they are described, the discourse is of colonization and the imagery is of the empire. However, it is more so with Maud Plunkett than Major Plunkett and here is Maud, old Maud was a ruddy, as ruddy as a tea rose, once her hair was gold, as a beer stein in firelight, but now she had stretched a map mapped arm from her nightdress and so on it goes on. But as you would see that it is constantly, uh, she would be constantly described in terms of a very European, uh, very Im imperial imagery, right. So, and of course, there is no son, he said uh, there is, they had a fine marriage, but there is no offspring to them uh, in the marriage. Yes, I think you would see it here in this description of Maud as uh, the major watches, he watched her silhouette, he watched the silhouette of his wife, her fine profile set in an oval ivory like a Victorian blocket. Uh, as when under cross swords she lifted her lace veil and so on, you know the colonies here, flag then was sliding down the hill stations of upper Punjab, the tea pavilions of the Raj and so on and it is all associated with this little sight of Maud Plunkett. So, as I said constant association with this colonial imperial imagery with Maud Plunkett. And here is the important thing about this, about Plunkett's in this plot or in this, in this uh, epic uh, ab about St. Lucia and this is Major Plunkett's decision, his love for Helen, his attraction for Helen leads him to decide to write a history. Helen needed a history. 
that was the pity that Plunkett felt towards her. So, that, that decision to write history for Helen is, is born out of pity, not his, but her story, not theirs, but Helen's war. The Helen here again, sorry, the Helen here, it is, it is a reference not just to the woman, of course, the woman becomes the occasion for history, just like woman, Helen of Troy becomes the occasion for this historical battle. Here, Plunkett's love for Helen leads him to this decision to write history, but also Helen as, as the island, St. Lucia itself as Helen you know, uh, at the center of colonial conflict. I discussed this again in the first lecture where the island is also known uh, of, you know, the Helen of the East because um, it's also known as uh, Helen of the East, sorry, because of uh, this constant tussle between the British and the French for this island. So, it's, it was all known as Helen of the East. So, so Major Plunkett's decision to write Helen's history is in a way also his decision to write, uh, he is going to write his, not his, but her story, right? Not his story, but her story, her story, sorry. But at the same time, how, how qualified is he to write that story? We are not very sure because he is, he belongs to this particular community. He does not really have the story of the African slaves. He does not have the story of the Arawaks. He has not seen what the Iguana sees, right? So, his story, his effort, his decision to write the history is him as a historian, uh, Major Plunkett as an historian is, would be questionable. His history will be questionable from his very, from his subject position. as a, you know, his subject position as a British war veteran. So, as I said that uh, it is questionable because here in the later part of book one, uh, in the one of the later chapters, we see that uh, he has decided that he wants to give, uh, he, it were, the place needed a true uh, place in history. So, St. Lucia needs a true place in history and he spends hours for, Hel on, um, for Helen's sake on research. And later on, where does he go? Where does it lead him? Sorry, where does the this research lead him to the battle of the saints? So the uh, and that is a battle between for the ownership between the colonizing powers for the ownership of Saint Lucia. And that's why I say that his history, its point of origin, it is that that history. Is it possible to write? Is it possible to write a single history for an island whose culture whose past has been uh, broken and broken or broken into or breached by various battles, colonizers, different masters taking over its present and its or taking over the authority of the island. So, how, how, uh, how reliable is going to is how reliable a history can Plunkett write? that is questionable or is it is it that dream visit or is it the dream visit of uh, Achilles to his uh, you know those would be kind of discounted as part of his uh, of authentic history uh, Achilles dream visit to Africa but that also is a part of St. Lucia's history because that is where the slaves the most of the po that is the history of most of the population in uh, St. Lucia but uh, this is a history that can be written down that Plunkett has decided, but what about the dream visit? What about the gods? What about the landscape that we dis, uh, discovered? Would that be, uh, become a part of history? Is it possible to write a single history or the, are there different histories of different people? What about the histories of Iguan, uh, sorry, of the Arawaks that is not remembered except by the Iguana who doesn't have the language to tell that history? So. How is it possible to write history in on this for this this uh, colony whose past has been repeated repeatedly broken into? So with that, we come to the end of first book, and uh, I hope it uh, makes 
sense it does make uh, it uh, it becomes easier to understand it's not an easy text especially if you if as i said if you're not really used to reading epic poetry narrative poetry but uh, i hope this helps and if there are any questions you can of course write to me so we move on to book two and i would go over book two quickly before going to book three which we are going to read a little bit more in detail as we have done book one. Thank you.